everything we know, from people and ants, to stars and galaxies, to quarks and atoms. The entire universe might just be a simulation running inside a supercomputer, inside an even bigger universe. Ancient philosophers said that the universe is a dream that we're waiting to wake up from. In this dream world of the imagination, anything is possible. All cultural items, from the dreams of our rodent-like ancestors, to books, to television shows, are merely permutations of the reality we think we live in. Today's age of computers and video games places simulations at the center of our cultural consciousness. A select group of us perform simulations for fun and profit, and we call them games, role-playing and otherwise. We live to run simulations. Join us on the Simulationist Podcast as we explore our culture of simulations. Hello, once again, welcome to the Simulationist Podcast. Uh, this is the 73rd of these things that we're doing, these iterations. 73 of innumerable. Of, yes, in uncountable uh, future episode iterations. Uh, and the date that we are recording this on is the 26th of January, 2014. And my name, as always, is Josh Levin, and co-casting at the other side of the table with me, as always... A much less raspy Ryan Kirkby. Yeah, you were all sick and, and hoarse last week, and this week you are uh, you sound much better. Well, I still got a little bit of a cough in the back. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to edit that out if it happens, but uh, no, no, I, I can speak and it doesn't hurt to do so. And that is so nice. Well, that's good, because we have lots of... Th- well. We always have lots of things to talk about, as, so lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, but this time, it won't potentially hurt the listeners' ears to hear me talk about it. Unless they're listening really loud. Uh, in which case, that's their own fault. Wait, I mean, why, why are you doing that? Turn it down. <laughs> we know you like us, but come on. No, no, just, just, just calm down. No, calm down, man. If, if you listen to us at work, you know, turn it up so that everybody can hear like uh, all the cool gaming stories and other stuff about video games that we talk about in real life okay sometimes we novel based wander into story <laughs> ideas too you know we like to cover all forms of fiction uh, but yeah the simulation what simulations have you been uh, running or I should say what oh this week, this week I got myself like elbow deep into uh, sto- uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup which is one of the classics of the uh, the online well not online but uh, uh, digitally transmitted uh, roguelike games now, I've always had mm-hmm. a, a passion for roguelike games. I remember being young and seeing someone go through a dungeon and, and picking stuff up and fighting monsters. Like, and that really got my interest. Maybe that's why I got into D&D. So now I'm getting back to the primal source and seeing how much it I really suits me. I'm going into these dungeons. I am delving. I'm exploring. I'm looking at uh, which god to worship. How nasty is this monster? Which spell should I try and learn? What race to be? Yeah. And it's all open there. And I'm I'm liking it. There's some bits I don't like. But the more I learn about what I don't like, the more I learn about who I am. Uh, for instance, uh, you can find shops within the various levels of the dungeon, but they won't buy you any of your things. Okay. So it doesn't uh, behoove like you to effectively be uh, the kind of guy that cleans every level of the dungeon, picks up everything, and carries every last orcish club with him to sell off. It doesn't benefit you. Okay, uh, yeah. <laughs> And I've always been the kind of guy that, uh, like, if I could find a crowbar, I would take even the things that are nailed down. Yeah. Well, I the way I've played all the recent games that I play, basically, I don't know if the gameplay encourages this or if, if it's my own behavior, but I collect everything, and I take everything I can take, and I, I either store it or I sell it for the what I can get for it. You know, I, I sort of optimize in that way, like, you know make the best use of even the, the uh, gray items in World of Warcraft, their, their names are colored gray or whatever. I'll take it back so I can <laughs> sell it off to the vendor. <laughs> or this one used to be a white item, now it's gray, maybe I'll keep it for sentimental value. Well, there are those. I mean, like arrows, for example. Arrows don't matter in Warcraft anymore, but everybody keeps them. Well, not everybody. People keep them as keepsakes. and Just in case <laughs> they become valuable for some reason. Well, they're never going to be valuable, but I suppose, I mean, the rarity in itself sort of it's a it's valuable. a symbol of age and status. Like I yep. was around when these mattered. Yep, exactly. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, I, like all these years, I've been playing like Dungeons and Dragons, going, and, you know, taking my adventure in, and I would take anything. You know, it's like, mmm, that stone altar of the, you know, of, of the cultists that they were worshiping there. And we killed the cultists. They they're not going to need that. <laughs> um, is there any way to fit it into my bag of holding to take it back and sell in town? The <laughs> stone altar. It only weighs uh, two, three tons. No, but I like I love this idea because um, I, I don't know if it started with the the whole Egyptian. Um, you know how the when the French went to Egypt and like started bringing back all the stuff from the pyramids and the the tombs and stuff. They started yeah. doing tomb raiding. Look, I got a little nice stone <laughs> scarab. It's of a place long gone. Ooh. And that like became a huge business. It's like ancient. Like mind anything you, mind you not in the best <laughs> way. That for no. a while there, they were using mummies as a fuel source. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, apparently firewood was too hard to come by between France and Egypt. So yeah. it's like, oh, just ship the mummies and we'll just burn them instead. Huh. And it's just like, I want to reach back through time and start smacking French people. Yeah. Not that everything has French people themselves, but historically, uh, um, um, the ones that burned mummies, that was you know, burning history. I suppose. Well, I mean, how did, with the mummies, didn't they? I well, there was a I lot of there was a lot of fake mummies being sold back okay, then. They, they would yeah, they, they would mummies. find a person. Hey, come on down this alley. <laughs> Bam! Knock them out, kill them. You know, <laughs> desiccate them up, and then wrap them up Make and sell them off mummy. as yeah. yeah. Um, but what I'm wondering is, like, would the pharaohs bury? I think they buried at least some of their servants with them, if not like but there hundreds are, or but thousands. But there are huge things you can learn about. Like like what life was like back then by studying the corpse. Yeah, you only need one mummy to really. Well, that's the thing. Is the more mummies you have to study, the more you can find trends. Oh, yeah. And there's okay. still some genetics you can no, sometimes get. That. So you can you can really get um the more mummies you have, the more samples you have, the better a sense you get of what life was like for the nobility, for the average person, for those who were serving the nobility. Were they effectively considered like a pseudo middle class? Like, were they getting decent cash that they could spend here and there, but they weren't, you know, like, actually upwardly mobile? You just got to attach yourself to the right figurehead? It would be nice to know, but we, we can't <laughs> really find out much about that anymore because uh, people wanted to burn them. Well, I'm sure some mummy, I don't know, some mummy survived, but... Well, it, it just Not strikes, survived, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> well, depending on how, how, how often you see the mummy uh, movies, you know, from Universal Horror, you know, sometimes they survive. But no, this strikes me as the same as those uh, dragon's teeth that they were doing uh, back before World War Two in China. Mm -hmm. uh, people were just finding this stuff and be like, "Oh, hey, here's a bone with a bunch of writing on it. What does it mean?" I don't know. And then people were saying, "Oh, well, you grind it down into a powder and then you put it in your tea and it cures things." <laughs> but what was really written on there yeah. was uh, well, old, old, really old dynasty. Like, like the cure for your whatever cold you have. No, what no they, I'm just going to grind this up in. Well, I, I, what, well, the thing was is that they'd write down their plans for the day, and when the bone cracked, that was seen as a good fortune. So they'd take bones out of, like, chickens or whatever, and they'd write down, today I will go to the market and, you know, buy some of this or that. Yeah, no crack, no, market's not a good day for the market. And they go, uh, today ah. is the day I shall declare war upon my enemies. Oh, cracked. Guess we're going to war today, guys. And so there was a. a, a if you grind them up, you get all that luck out of them. Wow, well, I don't know how lucky it was. I mean, farmers were just pulling <laughs> the stuff out of you know their fields, like ah, kind of junk, and then they're selling it to the people that would grind it up, sell them as dragon's teeth for an inflated price. And every time they were doing that, they were slightly erasing the di that one dynasty from Chinese history. Mm. Yeah. And, and so it just it's like every time you burn a mummy, you are removing a piece of potential history, and it's like. Oh, what are you people doing? That would be a public service announcement to all our listeners out there who, uh, if you should happen to find yourself coming across a mummy, an ancient Egyptian, or, you know, any region of the world for that matter... Um, Only burn it if your survival is at stake. Uh, I'm yeah. not going to tell you to die for the sake of history. I'm yeah, saying, yeah. unless, you know, your life is on the line, please do not burn or actively destroy history. We still That's don't right. have enough of a, a, a proper sense of value on the stuff, and we could stand to learn more. Plus, somewhere out there is somebody with an undergraduate that needs a master's project. Now, you know, a mommy, some dragon's teeth sort of thing. That's great stuff to study. Put out a little paper on it, bam, you've got your master's. 
And if you do find yourself in a survival situation, but maybe for some reason you have a camera with you or pen and paper, um, do some rudimentary documentation of what Try to save the head. There's a lot of <laughs> dental save stuff the, you can save learn. Save the teeth, yeah. yeah. Um, and this goes for our future listeners who are out in outer space, uh, you know, exploring other worlds. And, uh, of course, you probably already know that because they would have briefed you. Cause we they should have. <laughs> Unless you're just the janitor on the uh, space colony ship. And There's uh, nothing wrong with that. Even space needs janitors. That's a very that's true. proficient job. Actually, it... It'd be funny, like, I think, I imagine in the future, it'll be like, the janitor will be like, you know, the king, uh, <laughs> you know, in a in a space colony. Because, I mean, all that garbage, I mean, how can you, you can't live if if the thing gets cluttered or, or dirty or whatever. So. And uh, try as we might, humanity is garbage. We generate it. Even, even the best of the hippies, like, back where I grew up, there were people that would be calling themselves hippies, and they'd live out in the woods for a couple months, and when they left, garbage everywhere. Filthy, filthy people. Um, even if they were burying their latrines properly, still garbage and litter everywhere. Try as you might, humanity litters. Yeah. If you <laughs> if you want to be a janitorial, you know, custodian sort of thing up in space, you've still got yourself guaranteed job. As long as the robots haven't taken over... That's a good point. Well... If you're a robot janitor, it, congratulations, you've got the best of both worlds. You maybe. clean dirt, but you don't make any yourself, really. If you're a robot janitor and listening to this podcast, send us an email at thesimulationist at gmail.com. Let us know how your life is. Um, I think those Roombas are doing very well for themselves these days. Yeah, and maybe one day they'll achieve consciousness or something like that. Will they be angry that we put bunny ears on them? Hmm... I imagine no, because let's let's picture like aliens coming down to Earth and like putting bunny ears on our monkey ancestors. I think I'd laugh at that. You know, I actually think a gray alien with bunny ears on him looks a lot better. It's a lot harder <laughs> to, to like. Oh no, the aliens are coming for me! Uh, but you see them with like the the bunny ears on. It's like oh, the aliens are coming for me, and we're gonna have a wicked party somewhere. And then uh, <laughs> later on, you know, you you get uh, you know inseminated next to a cow that's getting himself anally cored, but whatever. At least you had that brief sense of like, oh right, aliens <laughs> travel across the stars to have a party with me. Let's yeah, rock it. It's like, yeah, this is some kind of uh, pop <laughs> band or something. Yeah. yeah, I'm all I'm saying is, you know, presentation really helps. And so, you know, a gray alien with bunny ears on himself looks like an alien that's ready to party. So if we went to an alien planet, like, should we find a local animal of some kind to to symbolize and and find out like it, see if they have an equivalent of a bunny there probably will be an equivalent to the, to to the rabbits sort of mm-hmm. but would it have like the long ears mm, possibly not uh those things are one of the they're really the flair of the species mm-hmm. um you they might have an exaggerated some other feature exactly. yeah yeah the, the ears might be more rounded like a mickey mouse sort of style in which case we get sponsored by disney as we <laughs> land and you know and talk to the aliens <laughs> with, with disney with mickey mouse ears on <laughs> to, to invade the hello alien, alien species <laughs> I, i'm pretty sure i've seen cartoons with the aliens wearing the mickey mouse ears was it a disney cartoon where they were doing that well it may have uh but no i Oh, well. <laughs> I think it was Bizarro. Is that, is that his name? Uh, I think he's a Canadian guy, but oh. I'm not sure. No, I was thinking Bizarro, like the Superman villain. The, well, the name of the guy is Pizarro, and the name of his Oh, Pizarro. Is, yes, is yes. Uh, yes. I remember him. Yeah, he does some fun stuff like that. But, uh, yeah, find a, find a non-offensive species with some nice characteristics we can mimic, and then just come up to the aliens kind of dressed like that. No, they're alien minds. Okay, so let me ask you this: If, if oh, but make sure they're not like like the prime like eating species. Like like if you're an alien landing on Earth, you don't want to come up and, and and be dressed like a cow or a pig, do you? Well, not ob- not like to fool people, but like if you had a, a cow mask or like a cartoon cow, they could come up, you know, and you got like a, a fake, you know, squiggly, you know, pigtail, yeah, and you're, like, and a pig snout on you. Mm. I don't know. That doesn't really say the right thing. It's like. Uh, you, you you guys do realize we we eat like seventeen different meat products from the pig itself. We we do all sorts of weird cutting for it, just for different chops and cuts. And and have you tried bacon? 
<laughs> it's probably lethal to you, but you got to try it. Well, it depends what part of the world they land in, too, because a good portion of the world will, will not eat pigs. And part of the world won't eat meat at all, for that matter. So, depending... <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Is, is that we can only say from our perspective. It yeah, might not if they be landed the in Canada, it's like land as any animal will eat you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. If they, they come up dressed kind of like a moose or, or, or like a beaver sort of thing, I think that we can kind of respect that. It's like, ah, you're trying to, to mimic our, our animals, you know, and all that. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Here in the us urbanized Canadians would be like, ah, we respect that. But like the... You know, Canadians in, in the in the bush in the north, blam. Well, no, that's the thing. That's why you meet, that's why you meet them in town. If you're okay. an alien trying to like encounter someone and you're dressed like an animal, do not do that out in the woods. <laughs> you're probably encountering a hunter, and that's how your species gets found. That's like how Bigfoot gets found, man, is as, yeah. as a corpse from hunters. Yeah. So you know, meet them in the city. Meet them in town. So there's two scenarios. So there there the gray aliens come to Earth. Mm. And they have two choices of headgear. The rabbit ears, like you said, or the Mickey Mouse ears. Which do you think is less, um, more, uh, I don't know, calming? <laughs> which one? I think for me, reaction? more calming would be the bunny ears. Maybe because the, bunny the ears. Mickey Mouse ears might indicate that they're trying to like pick you know, corporate alliances already. It's like, mm. the concept <laughs> of aliens doesn't yeah. scare me, but the concept of aliens wanting to play in our little uh, like weird games of, of corporate uh, sponsorships, that really freaks me out. But you don't. I mean, bunny ears could represent like Playboy, which is also a corporation. I guess not as big. Well, as Well, see, Disney. that's the thing, though. If if you're wearing bunny ears and you want to sponsor yourself with Playboy, you're also going to have to put on the uh, cocktail outfit and the fishnet stripes to make it work. I would agree. <laughs> I like the thought of that. <laughs> and see, if the alien comes on like that, I'm going to laugh. I mean, okay, yeah. Even then, it's just like, oh, the aliens saw like the Club 54 stuff from the 70s and thought that was what was appropriate. That's hilariously naive. So, yeah, I'm still okay. I'm still better than that. Um, now, here's the thing. What if it's the reptilian aliens? If a rep, if Because those things are like apparently yeah, okay. 8 feet tall and bulky and they got like really nasty teeth. If I saw one of them staring at me and he was wearing bunny ears, I would not think, oh, he's trying to mimic me. It's like... Oh God, he's eaten somebody with bunny ears, and that's his trophy. Okay, I, so. I'm surprised that you're not afraid of the gray aliens because I imagine like the gray with their big heads and stuff, they'd have all that telekinesis and hypnosis, and they'd basically be able to. Uh, you know, I would be afraid of their technology. And the brutes, the the reptilians, would be like, okay, well that's fun, but sh like take me to your boss, and we'll talk to him and sort this all out. And that's when they're taking you to the boss that you realize they've already chopped off one of your arms because they got hungry. <laughs> and you didn't feel it because they have, like, saliva that... Yeah, numbing, numbing numbs. poison saliva on there. <laughs> you just look down, there's blood... Oh, oh, come on, you guys. I'm going to meet your... Le that was my hand-shaking hand. Now i got to shake with my bad hand now. Yeah, although, <laughs> speaking of cartoons, do you remember the, the Gary Larson cartoon, The Far Side, where the... The aliens have hands for heads. Oh, yeah, and the it's farmer the winds up grabbing them by the head and shaking them violently. Because an intergalactic incident. <laughs> to be fair, if you're going to land on the planet, you might want to do some surveys first and find out if you look like something people grab and shake. There you go. Another PSA for you guys. We're just, uh, um, yeah, full of good advice for all of you people. For alien in the contact, future. yeah. Um, but that said, uh, I mean, with the, the I mean... The reptilian aliens are more physical. Like apparently, there's things about them, like like just standing still and doing something like a nine foot jump over like a chain link fence, just jong boing. Okay. That sort of thing kind of scares me because that's like saying physically I cannot outmatch you. But with the gray aliens, they they've always been dispassionately uh, intellectual. Do you think you might be able to reason with them, or you if not reason with them, I can at least debate them to a smiled standstill, <laughs> and then confuse them with my horribly uh, crooked logic. Okay. I figure I actually have a fighting chance against an intelligent alien as opposed to a brutish one. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you know, like, like xenomorph aliens, a predator alien. I I got nothing. All the best I can do is hope for a hide and dodge at the right time. Maybe I can survive it to the third act. Um. But no, no, the gray aliens, I might be able to, you know, I, you know, I am scientifically trained. I might be able to, to meet them on some fundamental level. Like, uh, oh, uh, for instance, the uh, the Lovecraft story at the Mountains of Madness. 
Yeah. Yes, yes. He encounters one of the uh, the the, co- uh, the cone-headed, you know, five, you know, uh, level symmetry alien with the weird hand things coming out of the top of its head. Mm-hmm. Uh, and these were the ones that uh, th- these were scientists. And so the guy who finds the the frozen corpses of them doesn't suffer the same insanity effects as seeing other horrible things that weren't meant to be known by man. Why? Because he's able to have that connection. He's a scientist, they're scientists, even though they're so vastly removed by discipline and purpose, they have put themselves close, uh, you know, closely united. Okay. And that, I think, is grand. So, from my perspective, a gray alien, even if they want to, like, steal my DNA and do weird, you know, hybrid tests with it, you know what? They're just looking at stuff. They're doing scientific testing. Sure, you don't need to abduct me. Just, you know, make me sure I sign the right papers beforehand. You don't even need to mind wash me afterwards. I just won't tell. I'm okay with the <laughs> scientific process and what has to be done. Even if it's a little weird and kind of creepy, and I don't know why you guys keep doing that with those cows. I will trust them. I'll, go, I'll <laughs> give them that. All right, so, well, uh, how did we get to um, looting, talking about uh, the, that game, uh, Stone Soup? Yeah. Yes, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup. I, I heartily recommend it for anyone who has a little time to kill and wants to have a little fun. Um, that said, I haven't gotten very far in it. I keep dying. Okay. I'm still experimenting myself with, do I want to go sneaky, you know, wear light armor, do light damage weapons, and, and just hope to sneak up? Because if you're stealthy enough, you can sneak up upon the... Uh, the creatures there that are, you know, sleeping in, in the game. They got little Zeds next to them. And yeah, with a dagger, you ah, slit the throat. There they go. They're dead. Um, oh, I see. Oh, but then again, I, the best uh, effect I had, you know, the best time I had was being a death knight in large armor, wicked good shield. That's just, I've gotten so much further through the dungeon until I got cheap shotted by a, a, a Jolton who cast an ice bolt spell at my head. Ah, uh, sorry, right. Jolton. Proper pronunciation. The what uh, a ice giant. Yolt head. No, y- yerk. What a yerk. Yes, the Yolton was a yerk. <laughs> I had half my life and he killed me with a single bolt. Like, what was up with that? Ah, well. That uh, game might be a little bit unbalanced. How old is this game? Is it? Uh, we'll see. Uh, the original guy was working on it from 1990 to 2000, and then the uh, Stone Soup crew took over and they've been doing it since. Okay. So they got almost yearly productions out of it so far. But it's constantly under development. Development ad- additions, like they've added extra wings, extra hard spots for those who yeah. have finished it, one extra challenge. They've added extra races. Like, you can play an intelligent cat. That's uh, fun. Can't really wear much for armor. Uh, you can't really, you know, lift a whole lot because you're cat-sized. But, uh, you know, if like you want... Like physically a cat. Yeah, you are physically a cat. <laughs> yeah. You're not like a feline sapien or anything. You yeah. are an intelligent well, Some, some games have those. Yes, and this one has a lot of races. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, being a cat is kind of out there. It's a nice extra challenge. It's a hard cla- <laughs> race to play. Yeah. Uh, that said, I might give it a try myself just to see how well it works, how much fun I have. Mm-hmm. If I have a lot of fun but don't survive long, I'm okay with that. So yeah. long as I'm having fun. Yeah, cool. So how about you this week? Uh, did you explore new ground and, and tread new waters? Uh, let me see. Did I explore any new ground? I didn't explore new... Let me see. In Minecraft? No. Um, treaded a lot of old ground. I, I did a lot of improvements on the town of... One of my towns um, in my uh, single-player world. Um, I decided that I wanted more... Um, what do you call it? Wheat blocks? No, hay hay bale blocks. Hay bales. Uh-huh. Yeah, and I I did a little bit of calculations, and basically, uh, hay bales are if you count the wor- all the work you have to put it because you have to plant nine bits of wheat and then grow them. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are harder to get than obsidian. Like it takes longer per stack of hay bales than it does per stack of obsidian blocks. Although that said, they are technically (laughs) infinite because you can grow them. It's kind of hard to grow infinite obsidian so far. Um, Yeah. Well, have you been to the Nether yet? Like, Uh, no, no. I was going to be doing that this last week, but then I downloaded the game and got very sidetracked. Because I think, yeah, for all intents and purposes, if you get to the Nether, lava is infinite there. I mean, it's 
technically it's finite, but it's... But mining it still <laughs> requires diamonds, and those are, you know, until you yeah. get to a town, large, very, very finite. They're, they're largely rare. Okay, yeah, so, I, yeah, I guess that's true. You have, in order to have my equation work out, you have to already have diamonds, and it helps to be have enchanting, because I have enchanting, like, something, like, fifth level of... Of enchanting, spe- uh, what is, I forget what it's called. Efficiency, yes. Ah. On the diamond pick, so so I get, I can harvest, um, I can mine obsidian. A lot of yeah, obsidian. Yeah, fairly quickly, and it's it's probably about as fast as it takes to, to, uh, chop um, stone with a wooden pickaxe or something. Oh, like not that. bad, not bad. Yeah. Um. But yeah, basically, like, so I was working out. You know, basically, it's equivalent. The for me, anyways, in my mm-hmm. single-player world, it's equivalent to you know a stack of obsidian or a stack of um, hay bale, hay bales, <laughs> which is I don't mind too much, and so so that's the thing. Like I'm, I wouldn't ask for a change, but I just find it I don't know intellectually interesting that that there's an equivalence there, um, even though they they're very different blocks and they do different things. I've, I'm kind of thinking about building like you know a castle out of Hay and obsidian. <laughs> Just I like hay obsidian castle. Yeah. Although now that I think of it, I want to do like um, the whole three little pigs. Like do a hay house <laughs> and then a, a wood stick house. house and a brick house, and have a pig in each one. Hmm. A pig in each one, or try and get pigmen. <laughs> or pig. Ooh, even yeah, that's even better. Zombie pigmen, and I can name them with name tags. And okay. then you just keep them tethered to the whole local area. Um, yeah, so I built like a f- three or four, and I think I'm probably going to build some more like giant uh, hay, f- uh, wheat farms mm-hmm. outside this one town. And I improved the inside of the town, made the buildings all a little bit nicer. Not, It's not 100%, but it's getting there. Uh, it's getting like nicer, and there's villagers, and there's I put some iron golems in there. Um and uh, yeah, making it into a real like production town, like where they there's tons of hay and stuff. Oh, and did you know in the new update uh-huh. they are the villagers are going to harvest hay oh. or harvest wheat for you. So then it very much does behoove you to be uh, in towards the town. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't think I'm not sure. Yeah, because they harv they they pop it like they explode they, it or whatever. They walk over and pop it up. Yeah, and then they replant the seeds, mm-hmm. but they don't. I don't think they pick up the the hay them the. Oh, that's the wheat too bad. Themselves. I was kind of hoping they pick up the the uh, the wheat and then toss it in uh, like a nearby treasure box. Yeah, I don't think they do that. I mean, it, that's the thing. This it's still it's another one of these things that's in development, so they might change it. Um, but I, you probably could put like a hopper next to it and hope that it falls in there when they walk over it mm. but it wouldn't be a hundred percent so I think you kind of have to follow the villagers around well at um, least they're doing something as opposed to just walking around and staring at each other that's kind of creepy yeah yeah and I like it and well that's the thing I, I'm just s- speculating on how it's going to work but it actually doesn't for s- for certain uses like for the way I use farms it actually isn't optimal because they'll they'll make make sure that the farms stay like green and young, rather than letting them grow to maturity. And so the player can't come in and just harvest mature mm. wheat. So I think that might not be as good. But actually, I think it's a more int- it makes the world more interesting. More they're dynamic. doing something. Yeah, so and I, there probably will be a way for players to exploit it and. Which is, I mean, that's players will do that. Yeah, I mean, you can't. That's just how it goes. Yeah, it's if you want to try and stop them, well, you can't. You're not, you're not playing the meta game right. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's so that's how, what I've been doing uh, this week. Um, improving nice. towns. Yeah. And uh, what I like about this though is it sets up a coding precedent. So if you want to create like a uh, like a straw golem that will do that sort of stuff for you when you're away from a town. Oh yeah, yeah. Then you could create this straw golem as you want and what does it do for its behavior? Well, you can look at the code from the villagers and it's all there. Yeah, yeah, that's so. helpful for somebody like me who has to, basically, yeah, I take the code from other places. I don't write my own code. You're usually. a code snipper. I just, I just find what they have already done and 
Cause I've well, that's how things start with the War Fortress. Is, uh, yeah. Most of it is just, okay, I want a new race. Uh, I'll c- take Elf as the base, and then I'll modify it as need be. Mm-hmm. That's all it, it really is for a lot of coding. Yeah. And, well, it's true. Like, you see in, in updates, since I remember, like, World of Warcraft, you start seeing a lot of the same sort of architecture appear over and over again like you know the the little mini dungeons that are in the real world and stuff ah, you go yes. in there and they they all sort of have the same plan and it's like uh, i i'm not sure how much i like it but it does save the designer's time and it's like well we've already created this so let's just yeah. start with that as a base this is basic cave it. number 1 in this yeah. one there's uh you know uh demons in there same cave pattern this one's got centaurs same cave pattern this one's got defias cult members Exactly. Eh, whatever. I understand it, it helps them save time. Plus, it really does help keep the players from getting lost. Otherwise, you know, there'd be people, ah, how do I get out of this cave? That's true. I mean, well, I've, I've gotten lost-ish in, in some World of Warcraft dungeons, but, I mean, when I say lost, I just mean it takes me an hour to get out. I mean, I eventually get out, but... Um, I, and I don't know. Yeah, Wailing <laughs> Caverns was really bad for that one. You know, yeah. People like, how do I get up there? It's like, you, did you hop over? I have to hop. I have <laughs> to coordinate moving forward with a space bar. Ah! <laughs> I don't know if that was purposely put in there to 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 aggravate people or what. Because I I remember every time running Wailing Caverns, you got five people. At least one person would fail that jump, and then they'd have to run around, make sure they go in the area. No one. Uh, you know, they keep the away from the areas that we didn't clear out and go around <laughs> and come on back. Yeah. And then try it again. And fingers crossed, they made it the second time. So. Yeah. Although, what they should have done is made it so that if anyone can get across, you know, it's like, okay, I know how to jump. Don't worry, guys. They jump across, and then you hit a small switch, and then, like, a board falls down, so everyone else can just walk over. No worries. Yeah, that makes more sense. I think the intention was that players weren't supposed to be, like, blazing through. Like, that's the thing about Wailing Caverns that I always experienced when I went in there is that everyone I was with had already done this, like, 50 times, and they were all like, oh, let's get through this, let's go, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, I mean, if you look, if you stand still for a few seconds, you look around, there's some beautiful scenery inside that. <laughs> there is, um... But it is very twisted, going back in this way and over to this way, yeah. and then you got to go back to Narelex over here and all that. Um, but I'm saying just take your time. Just uh, Well, yes, but it would have. I think it would have been nicer if they had had something where he's like, okay, one person jumped over, and now you click the small switch over here, and uh, you can get a board Actually, yeah, to, to does, drop down yeah. and uh, like a, a rope ladder so that if anyone who misses the thing can climb up. And it's yeah. not that bad. Yeah, you just wait as the sense. guy makes sure to click and, and has their little uh, you know tune climb up. Although I don't. Do, do, they don't have a ladder mechanic in World of Warcraft, do they? No, but it wouldn't be that difficult to work in. Yeah, just, or yeah, one would it. think, apparently they still haven't put in those <laughs> extra dances they promised us two expansions <laughs> ago. Yeah. And I don't know why, because i got to say, the Torrens could use more dance moves. They only got the two. And it gets kind of old. I really have had different. a lot of fun just watching uh, like a, my new... Um, uh, panda characters, Pandaren do dance. their dances. Cause what kind of dances do they do? Um, I, I don't even know how to describe. I think you just. Have, uh, you'll, I'll, oh, you I'll have later. to Google it. Okay. Um, I don't even know how to s- describe it. Yeah, I gotta look up their taunts and their 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 silly comments too. Yeah. Uh, I haven't rolled a Pandaren lady yet, a lady panda, so oh. I don't know how they talk or dance or anything like that. So. I'll that might be it's worth looking up because uh, they do make sure to make sure you know both you know genders get different dances. Yeah, it's kind of fun. Different one. Although honestly, with with the Torin, they got so few dance moves. I would like to pick up any other you know races some of their moves, something, <laughs> even if I'm just copying the gnomes. Mm-hmm. It's just not a lot of moves. I mean, everyone's partying and they, the the blood elves are dancing all fancy like. I just I'm just doing peanut butter jelly time. That's all I got. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, the Torrid, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's another aside. So, uh, so that's what you've been up to is, is contemplating <laughs> the concept of hay bale obsidian castle combos. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Groovy. I can dig it. Um, 
Yeah. We, well, we wanted to also. I don't know if this is a really big story or whatever. But there, there was a funny. St- well, this one is, is uh, I think, a nice news. little uh, exercise in storytelling. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, it's be the uh, the Russian ship was it the Orlova? Uh, yes, that's what I just I looked up before we started the podcast. The it is a or it was a Russian ship at one point. Um, it was being docked in Canada for about a decade half. Yeah, it was docked in Canada, and then it got um, it got loose. No, no. Okay, it was getting transported from A to B, like they're going down to what the Caribbean so, or somewhere. So yeah, they were going to move it from like Newfoundland to the Caribbean. And um, the tow rope snapped. This was, I, don't, I think, 2012. But the the details are important. You can, I don't know, look up the. the you want to find the real yourself. history? Look it <laughs> up. Yeah. Right. So the details aren't aren't important. But the, the story is that it got loose, and they they didn't know where it. I guess they couldn't follow it or whatever when they. They, they just <laughs> the tow. Well, they weren't checking their rear view mirror. <laughs> <pretty well enough. laughs> they weren't looking behind them. Oh, gee, that. That ship we were towing is gone. How huh? long has that thing been missing? Because I ain't looked back there in like four hours. And it was there four hours ago, but I, I can't see it anywhere on the horizon now. So when was the last time one of you guys looked backwards? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, God, we are so going to get in trouble for this. Yeah. Uh, so So this ship... Well, the thing about ships is every ship has rats on it. Like, that's just a fact of... Reality. I, I, well, I'm just saying. I don't know if that's true. That's the, part of humanity as well. We are garbage and rats, <laughs> especially a ship that's basically just been sitting at a dock for a couple of years or however many years it was sitting at the dock. So yeah, so it had rats on it, and so so people like you know they wrote up news stories. You know, this appeared in the news. You probably, in fact, yeah, if you're listening to this, you probably already heard it. Um, but yeah, people are speculating that well, obviously there's going to be rats on them. What do they have to eat? Nothing. Like. They have to eat each other. So, naturally, well... There's a derelict <laughs> Russian rat cannibal ship. And that's what the story comes to. And it, and it, I guess it drifted maybe a year or maybe, like... A year or so, so far, maybe. <laughs> well, yeah, nobody knows where it is. And it most likely, like, of, of well, all the possibilities... Here's the thing that, that gets me, is okay. they don't know where it is, and yet they're still tossing sonar out across the both coasts of America... Just to, to make sure there's not like enemy subs or anything, and this is causing actual problems with you know creatures with sonar, whales, dolphins. Mm-hmm. They're apparently getting uh, you know like bad communications. It's like trying to talk like in a club when there's a lot of background music playing sometimes, yeah. and some of them are suffering hearing damage from this. And the purpose, uh, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you potentially harming the sea creatures? And it's like, we need to know where the ships are and what's coming and going so that we don't wind up, like, with an enemy terrorist ship getting us on an unknown. Where's the Orlova? I don't know. Yeah, it seems odd that in today's day and age you you don't... I mean, why they didn't put a <laughs> GPS tracker on that ship to begin with is a little bit beyond me. I figure if you're going to take a ship somewhere, a, both ships have GPS broadcast them you know, to the nearest satellite, and then, you know, whoever has the right codes can, you know, monitor where the heck their ship went. Yeah, well, the the reason they they believe it, it was, like, it hadn't sunk, like, they could have just assumed it's it It's too sunk, awesome a well, story. <laughs> no, um, they actually did have some, I, I think it was radio transponders or something, that are apparently attached to the lifeboats. And ah. This is probably some regulation. I don't know if it's Canadian regulations or just international... But basically, yeah, they, so when a lifeboat is deployed, it automatically sends a signal. So wait, did the rats deploy a lifeboat? Uh, yeah, they may have. That's awesome. That's awesome. Because, yeah, because this signal went off. It's like, oh, a lifeboat has been, been deployed in this ship that apparently nobody has, has heard from for a, over a year or however long it was at the time. Um so, so that's why they they speculated that it was still adrift. In this Although, case, it was something that like a weather thing that just knocked it off, and then oh, okay, you're no longer attached to the ship. Beep beep beep. I would imagine, yeah, especially like ships take. This is why they talk about things being ship shaped because they take daily work and a lot of upkeep. And if you're not constantly um, doing like you know having people yeah. scrambling around your ship. It's going to fall apart fairly quickly. I mean, that's the nature. Not necessarily that right? quickly. There was a Canadian ship that got trapped in the Arctic ice, and everyone had to abandon it. It's like, ah, okay, you know, get on the dog sleds, come back to, to civilization. And they assumed the ship would just get crushed by the ice and sink. 
But for 40 years thereafter, it was seen derelictly wandering the waters around <laughs> Canada. Like the, the Arctic Ocean. Yeah, the Arctic Ocean, um, up and over in the Alaska area, apparently. I'd have to double-check to find out the name of the ship, but it'd be four decades and still seaworthy. Now that is ship shape. Yeah, I'd say so. Well, I, I uh, well, I don't know if it was <laughs> technically sailing every <laughs> part of every year because it would get frozen in the ice. Frozen then it again. was just like uh, in dock for the winter, right? That's actually kind of surprising to me because I would think that the just the action of the ice itself would basically break a boat. No, right? no. Some of these of these ships meant yeah. for the Arctic waters. They build them to last. I guess so. I mean, we have icebreakers that are obviously built. Not that the icebreakers can always make it through the ice. I mean, the uh, the ship down mm-hmm. in, in Antarctica managed to prove that uh, you can have an icebreaker get stuck in the ice, and then mm-hmm. other icebreakers can't get to it because they get trapped in the ice or just it's too thick. Yeah, it's kind of sad that we haven't conquered our impl- entire planet yet. Well, here's the thing. We could force the way through, but that would involve stuff like uh, flamethrowers coming out the front. <laughs> and that, that is a bad use of petrochemical resources. Yeah. Well, could you even have that much? Well, you can fit a lot of fuel on a boat. Well, if you really wanted to, you could have a huge ship with a nuclear reactor on there, <laughs> and then you could just you know, just utilize nuke, some of the laser technology. The ice shelf. I'm sure that would do wonders for the... Uh, Climate. Well, here's the fun thing about it is, is uh, there are some nice American military thing testing with lasers where they can, uh, you know, with uh, about a second and a half, blow a hole in the side of the ship with their their laser weapons. They're still in testing, uh, but yeah, they they will liquefy a nice, perfectly round hole sort of thing in the side of a ship. I don't believe lasers can. Oh, Lasers and microwaves. It's a combination okay. sort of thing. You you want to make sure you're targeting this dang thing right, and if you can't see the microwaves, use a laser to know where you're going. So the lasers are for targeting? Okay. Partially targeting, and uh, with some of the really high-end laser stuff, you can you can pack a nice punch in there. Uh, again, I'd have to double-check the stuff. You could, I, I'm pretty sure you can find some clips of the stuff up on YouTube. I think I remember reading an article in Popular Mechanics about laser weapons, that like sort of anti-missile weapons. Um, I'm not sure. Turns out it works well on ships too, because ships move slower than most missiles. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, so that's easier to easier. target. Yeah. Um, but they do require a huge payout of of, of, of energy. So you, if you're doing this on a ship, like you really, you don't want an icebreaker. You want an ice obliterator. Mm-hmm. You're going to need a nuclear powered mm-hmm. vessel. Nuclear laser, sweet. You're going to need nuclear vessels. Yeah. Well, and I imagine, like, the the stuff that's classified is probably ten years ahead of the stuff that we read about in popular mechanics, so... At least ten, likely (laughs) twenty in some cases. Yeah, I'm not sure how how far exactly, but yeah, like, what sort of stuff are we getting declassified now? Like, I guess stuff from... So, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, apparently they do have stuff (laughs) that'll fry a penguin in five (laughs) seconds. But uh, they're not using it because even for you know American military standards, that's excessive. Yeah, and expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Although, just wait till they put that up on like a you know like a solar satellite sort of thing, and then it's like, oh, you're stuck in the ice. Boom! Blast a nice little line out there. <laughs> now you're not. You're welcome. Salute. Cool. Uh, no, and, but yeah, and that's <laughs> that's the American <laughs> use of force in the military. I approve. Okay, yeah, to get people <laughs> out of the ice. <laughs> You're stuck in the ice, bam! <laughs> Big old missile, you know, uh, laser from the sky. Yeah. There's a clear path for you, I found it. You're welcome. So, you know, two thumbs up if you're doing that. But this is something to, I don't know, throw in your stories or yes, whatever. Yes, yes, the, the Orlova <laughs> itself is a plot that basically writes itself a dozen yeah. different ways. Here you have a derelict ship floating the waters that may very well be inhabited by starving, cannibalistic rats. Yeah, and if you have a little bit of magic in your campaign, maybe they mutate a little bit. Well, that's the thing, is is you can just uh, picture this as a short story you're writing yourself. Uh, Myself, I take it, a retired couple, you know, they sold their house, they bought a boat, now they're they're living the life on the seas, and they're, you know, doing like a week, two or something, they're like, they they don't stick to the coast, they go out and they have a little fun, they're experienced, you know, uh, sailors. You know, so they go on out, and what do they see? A derelict ship, and then they, you know, they go up and they dock on it because you know, derelict ship, eh? You know, watch out, and then you know, they go on the <laughs> ship, yeah. bam! Cannibalistic rats sort of thing, you know, like, ah, you know, forget the cat jumping out of somewhere. Heck, maybe they have a cat. Maybe the cat goes missing first. 
ominous sign of things to come. <laughs> All they find is the collar and a lot of blood. I suppose. Well, how would you rate the story involving an, uh, an Orlova type incident? Uh, well, I was gonna say, uh, like a derelict ship. It's it might be like old and stuff, but it also it might be salvageable. And technically, if you find salvaging something salvaging rates on even a uh, uh, derelict ship that's uh, very old like that, that is good money. Yeah, I think if you find something in the op- in the international waters, I think it's yours. I think finders keepers still the rule. I, I do believe that was the premise for the uh, the movie Virus. Which is a good, a nice adaptation sort of thing on that that involves all sorts of other fun. Uh, not a big thinking movie, but I do recommend everyone out there watch it. Uh, but yeah, no, I like your retired couple. <laughs> I just don't want another like, oh, you know, we're we're just out of our teens, sort of young adults, sort of. Thing. No, no. Yeah. Every once in a while, I want to hear a story about mature people with a lot of background, like. Maybe the guy's really good. You know, he's always been tinkering. He's got 40 years of tinkering experience. Next thing you know, he's got a makeshift flamethrower on there. <laughs> he's keeping the rats at bay. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> he's only got a couple shots left, but he's got to use them wisely. That's how he's protecting himself and his wife. So you can have yeah. a lot of fun with that sort of thing. Because the guy's got the experience. It seems more feasible than a 20-something like, Oh yeah, I know how to make flamethrowers happen. How? Uh, internet. No man, come on, <laughs> come on. The internet. So yes, yes. How would you, how would you write the the story with the the Orlova as a central you know uh, plot element? Uh, where to begin? Uh, the story would be yes, the old re- the the retired couple comes upon it and uh, it's just floating around there. Um, hmm. I probably would want something more than just the cannibalistic rats, though, as cool as that is. Well, I mean, that could be a chapter, I guess, in a bigger book. You could go supernatural, man. You could have, like, zombie rats, skeletal rats going around there. Ooh, like, extra creepy. Skeletal rats, yeah. And best of all, because the skeletal rats would be so light and buoyant, they would float. So even if the couple makes it back to their ship, there's, like, all these skeletal rats coming after them and just kind of going like, like flying fish hopping through the water after them. That makes a nice mental sight, man. That's, that's what you put on the cover of your book. <laughs> Je- a skeletal rat jumping through the water like a flying fish. Not just fish. one. Several of them <laughs> coming coming at the ship as, as you know, there's a couple, ah, pointing, no. Ah. <laughs> that's what you got. That's your front cover, man. Oh, yeah. Um, I, well, no, I want them to save the rats and be like, and make them their pets. And then, like... Oh, so they're like the nearsighted them. couple that, that, that uh, <laughs> adopts the little chihuahua and, you know, and tries taking it home with them across the border sort of thing. And, no, that's a rat. Oh, no! <laughs> I've been sleeping out with it for a week. It's been on the bed. That sort of thing? Yeah, okay, except they don't, like, put them on their bed or anything. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm going extra on that. But they just get a sweet ship, and then they, like, put the rats in... I don't know. Well, you can't... I don't know. Like, I don't even know how that works on a ship. Like, can you put... If there are rats on the ship, it's not like you can catch them all and put them in cages. They just sort of live on the ship. <laughs> I mean, well, you, you, if they're starving rats, you can very much lure them into a proper cage, and thereafter the taming process can properly begin. And then, then you can tame them, yeah. And then, you know, like, you know, teach them to uh, steer the ship and stuff. Like, Oh, so it, can be, so it could be like a, one of those fun, like, fantastic voyages sort of thing, eh? Yeah, and then the rats become your crew, and oh. then, like, um, and then you go around sailing the world, and the rats, like, they become pirates, and the rats... Pie rats! <laughs> There is your bad part of the day, folks. Um, and then the rats... Although I suppose if they're good at heart, you could just call them buccaneers instead of pirates, sort of thing. They go around saving the day sometimes, you know, just being yeah. general swashbuckling yeah. rats. Swashbuckling rats. Um, Tiny little buckles to swash. And yeah, and then no, like people go back to port and they're like, you won't believe like what happened to us. We lost our ship and and rats, and then nobody believes them. Because they said you won't believe them, but they didn't. So also, it sounds like something that requires drugs to to, to fuel. You know, it's like, well, you actually believe that happened to you? So, well, you guys took the good stuff with you when you went on your ship trip, didn't you? See, but I mean, just just out of my head, I can picture even two other ways to take this sort of story. <laughs> yeah, let's just okay. take it like a, like a, yeah. like a Dracula type thing. You know how he has the ship and it winds up uh, when he's going from the. Uh, you know, his old world, and he makes it over to, to London, how he drains the blood of, of the sailors, and there's a derelict ship going there, right? Oh, right, yeah, yeah. So what we do is we have the Orlova coming into port for a small uh, little uh, 
uh, town, like one of those nice little isolated towns that's, you know, got maybe the one line in and out for a thing, and, and cell phone towers aren't big. Nice and isolated, because that's how you want to play this sort of thing. And it comes crashing, and it crashes in the dock, and people investigate, why did it, what's up with this ship? It's derelict, and that's when the rats come pouring out. Forget <laughs> zombie apocalypse. This is the rat apocalypse. Uh-huh. As the people just have to deal with this horrible, overwhelming swarm of, of, of super starved rats coming in and gnawing the way through doors and trying <laughs> to eat anything they can get. Uh-huh. People, you know, animals, you know, go and they, they clean out the supermarket in less than an hour. There's a huge amount of rats, like unnatural numbers. Just, just why didn't they eat each other down to more manageable amounts? No, they are. Uh, they come in. And so that way, you get uh, people with dissimilar personalities. You put them in a locked-in confined area, and you move like maybe the confined area from A to B, or up and up in a way as they they slowly like lose sections of, of a house or whatever to to the, the swarming rats. And then that way, you can tell a wonderful story of conflicting personalities, which is the central basis for a lot of good stories. Yeah. And you don't have to use zombies because zombies are kind of overused from many perspectives. Yeah. So no, man, it's, it's the rat it's, horde. It's the rat horde instead of the zombie apocalypse. Or, cool. if you want to right. add a supernatural element into it, uh, you call it, still call the ship the Orlova, but it's no longer a Russian freighter or anything like that. It's a cruise ship. And what happens? They get lost in the Bermuda Triangle, and that's when the rats start coming up and attacking. And then you've got people in the confined spots with weird stuff happening. You get ghost fire and, and you know all sorts of like, oh no, those those planes crashed 50 years ago going so, over So here. the rats come out of the portal to the rat dimension? They're just no, they're just like going crazy from whatever oh. energies is coming up and it's Okay, the psychic energies, sure. The weird the weird yeah. energies of the Bermuda Triangle. Yep. And so, you know, like they can't radio out. They're lost in the Bermuda Triangle. They're like one of the people that gets lost forever. What's happening to them? The rats, the crazed, you know, they like raged rat hordes are coming up and you know they're you, I mean, I, have you ever seen the Poseidon adventure? You know where the ship gets turned upside down, you got to like make the way um, I recommend the classic one as opposed to the uh, remake they did recently, because the classic one has more old celebrity stars, and you might be able to recognize them. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's a ship-based adventure where you know you're fighting against you know overwhelming odds and horrible disasters happening. You can include the weirdness that happens. You can get ghosts from like World War Two. God, I'm Sweet. dying forever. Save me as I try and kill you accidentally. Is there? Are there movies about Bermuda Triangle? Like there Probably a few. Um, no great high-budget definitive one. So if you guys are out there listening and you're in Hollywood, you're a scriptwriter, <laughs> and you want to make the big thing... Yeah, Hollywood, where's the Bermuda Triangle They've movie? done their ghost ships, they've done the horrible yeah. things, and their phantasms, and their Cthulian beasts from the deep coming up, and that's all being told, but no one has done the Bermuda Triangle as a definitive, oh, this is the summer blockbuster horror adventure you've got to watch. So... There's your niche. There's your start. Yeah, just it make sh- be called Bermuda Triangle. Yeah, yeah. there's your title right there. Law. You know, you call it a Triangle Lost sort of thing. And that was something that you know pulls the people in. Okay. So you know, there you go. And, and so there's like we've told four uh, great stories based <laughs> on this sort of thing. Yeah. At least four basic plots. Um, and that's for you guys out there. So yeah, you take the concept of the Arlova. A derelict ship, um, just lost out in the infinite waters of the ocean, with the potential threat of cannibalistic rats or something else otherwise, and use it as the basic for a short story for your own concept or ideas. And just even if you're, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to write anything out. Sit down and think about it as you're going to sleep, and let your mind drift like the ship <laughs> upon the ocean. Uh, indeed. And uh, and so yeah, that's that's a little exercise for everyone out there. There's there's your plot point. How would you incorporate that into a story? Where do you take it? And I mean, we've we've given four decent <laughs> ideas, yeah. and that's four the starts thing. anyways. Four well, that's the thing is, there's yeah. four that we came up with between yeah. the you know the two of us. You could take it any sort of different ways. Maybe you want to keep it purely you know like, like natural. Maybe you want to add an even more supernatural sort of thing. But there's your 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 basic plot point. And it just writes itself. So many stories, you can just just pull its threads here and there. Whichever one catches your eye. Maybe maybe because it's a Russian ship, you want to do something involving the Cold War. Maybe you read up on the history and you find out it was a uh, uh, you know made in Yugoslavia. It was, and, yeah. And you know something about like uh, the Yugoslavian uh, history, you know, and curses. Maybe the ship was always cursed. 
And maybe that's how you want to play it. Maybe the fact that it's derelict now, that's only the last in a long string of things to uh, you know happen with this ship. Take it whichever way you want. There's your basic plot idea for, for mental rumination. <laughs> Alright, so yeah, that's, I think we've talked about that story plenty. I mean, we could talk, we could go ahead for another half hour on that, but we have other things to talk about, as we always have some yes, things to uh, talk about on this well, show. <laughs> and that's, uh, the big thing that got me about uh, playing the, uh, the Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup was that uh, the starting class you pick doesn't really do much in the long term. It uh-huh. decides as to how proficient you are in some skills. So your class is in like warrior, mage, warrior, monk. scald, yeah, monk, uh, gladiator, okay. adventurer, alchemist, and all that sort of thing. No, arcanist and all that helps determine what you're proficient with. With uh, the venom mage is proficient with uh, poison-based spells, you know, and that's how it works. Congratulations, that works out nicely. If you go with the uh, the naga, they've got affinity for it, so they gain even more proficiency based on it. But the thing is, is the class only determines the basics. You can overcome any of those negatives. My monk did not start off with a heck of a lot of positives in spell casting, and yet, you know, right now the one I'm running is more proficient in spell casting than actual melee combat. That makes sense. So basically, what the things that you do through the course of your adventure sort of steer what you learn and and the things that you're able to do in the future. That yes, uh, what you are doesn't matter as much as what you do, but also the concept of race. Uh, it helps determine how quickly your stats go, how quickly you level, what you can wear, how many of them you can wear. There's like octopoid people. They mm. can wear ten rings as opposed to just two. <laughs> right. Which is, you know, kind of awesome. Um, so octopuses have eight arms? Yeah. Octo- they have eight arms. Why well, because they, they they're rings? octopoid people, so I assume oh. they've got regular <laughs> arms in addition. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. No, I okay. haven't seen an actual image of them, and, and, and it gets a little weird. But uh, but yeah, the Naga and all that, to some of the, the less human ones, can't wear the proper armor. If you're playing the intelligent cat race, the Felids, um, you can't wield any real weapons because you've got cat's paws. There's no opposable thumb there for gripping. Yeah, makes sense. Um, some races are vegetarian. They can't eat meat. Uh, the uh, the ghoul characters can eat rotten meat. Mm. What you are as a basic race determines much more of what you can do and your abilities than your class. Well, and that struck me as being very interesting because in D&D... Your class is just an initial, uh, you know, like, like concept, and that matters all throughout the thing. However, you level. Oh yeah, yeah. What level of class are you? That matters highly. What race you are affects you at the start, maybe for the first couple levels, and then it's just statistical noise. That plus two you gain to dexterity. You, you know, they got rings and, and magic items to do the same thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's different approaches to. So, so yeah, so. I mean, it, uh, we're not saying one approach is better than the other. We're, like, emphasizing race over class or class over race. Uh, but it, it does change how it all feels. Mm-hmm. And it, it occurs to me, like, I've made fun of D&D with the whole thing. Like, oh, yeah, green skins. Why do you know you're supposed to kill the orcs and goblins? Well, because their sk- uh, skin is green. That's not racist at all. <laughs> oh, this elf is black skin. They must be evil. And yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I'm problem. not the only one that's made the, that that sort of joke and, and picked on that aspect of it. But from a mechanics standpoint, there's not a lot after the first couple levels that differentiate like a third level orc fighter from a third level goblin fighter from a third level drow fighter. Yeah, and also like, what's the cost of your your well, t- a couple things: your low level d- disguise kit, for example, or like you know, get somebody in your party to dress you up as a different. Race. I mean, you can if they're really good at it, they can make a really good check, and basically, you look like you're not <laughs> an elf anymore. You look like you're a human. So that overcomes like the racist effects you might encounter in some isolated cities or nasty yeah. nations. So your race has can can potentially have literally zero. And that I mean, in, in, you know, even in and that, that low level, spell. yeah, low mm-hmm. level spells for for illusion. Just you know, okay, now you look like a dwarf. Congratulations, Mr. Elf. You go into the dwarven areas. Ho, ho, ho. I am a dwarf. I'm a dwarf. I'm a dwarf. Or even reincarnation spells can reincarnate you as a d- totally different. And you act really are that. Yeah. Race. And, and so it, it occurred to me, uh, by playing this game, 
that D&D actually has a very forward-looking view as to how things go. Your race really doesn't matter. Sure, maybe you're more inclined to, you know, do, uh, you know, uh, stone-based work if you're a dwarf, but that doesn't stop you as an elf from doing that as well. Mm -hmm. And that plus two bonus, especially when you get towards the higher levels, is completely negated by what you can get for magic bonuses, item bonuses, circumstance effects. It just becomes statistical noise well, what your I race is. I exactly say noise. I, I get what you're saying, that it's not as important, but it's still... Well, what's like that thing plus is two still adds on on top of whatever magical well, pluses you can get. But that's the thing. Is, is, is there really that much of a difference between a plus 12 as opposed to a plus 10? Hmm. Yeah, probably not that much of a difference. Exactly. Uh, you know, as opposed to your class levels, which really do matter, determines which skills you can take. And so... It's all centered around your class in D and D, what you see yourself as. And don't get me wrong, that may you know impose like class based you know restrictions, like uh, oh you can't do this sort of thing because you're not in the proper tier of power. You can't cast spells, and that causes its own problems. But it really doesn't matter after the first couple levels as to what uh, what race you are, and uh, and so it's very forward thinking in that perspective. Like back, you know, in, in the in the seventies, when when it came out, there was mo- a little bit more restrictions on there. Like uh, certain uh, demi-human races could only advance to certain levels, you know, max. Like oh, you know, like uh, you're a halfling fighter, enjoy level seven because that's as high as you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, the going all the way back to the, I I don't know what it was called. It wasn't even called first edition, was it? When they had. They had races. just Dungeons and Dragons versus yeah. expert and versus encyclopedia stuff. It was dwarf it, was a, its yeah. own thing. Dwarf and elf were ra- were classes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, they were. were well, I, mean, I suppose mm-hmm. we'll take a note from the uh, the Rifts games and we'll call mm-hmm. them racial classes. Yeah, sure. As like, opposed you to like, like uh, you know occupational classes. But you your party would consist of here's the fighter, here's the mage, here's the dwarf, like, <laughs> and here's the thief. Well, that's the thing. Is, is you, you drop a fighter, you pick up a dwarf, it's the same thing. You drop a yeah. the magic user, you put an elf, it's the same thing. And I suppose they figured that out in later editions, and that's why they said, well, here's your race, and here's your class, and they're different things, and you can mix and match them as you will. And they yeah. sort of gradually took away restrictions. Well, yeah, back in second edition, they had, it's like, oh, you want to be uh, like a dwarf and wizard? That's not allowed. Dwarves yeah. can't be wizards. Yeah. Uh, but they got rid of that. So as of third edition... It was very much more progressively minded, but not in your face about it. Um, you could potentially see this racist. Oh, yeah, 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 dwarf, yeah, spellcaster. Yeah, that's really going to be good. Oh, yeah, yeah, you suck at your spell optimization for your character. It really doesn't matter that much after the first couple levels. That's true. Yeah, like, I, I, I once just you for become, fun, once I would you become roll great, you're great. races that didn't fit yeah. with their classes just to see what I can do with it. And those, yeah, those are really fun. To Halfling barbarians are entertaining. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. They're fun. Yeah. Tiny rage. <laughs> oh, 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 now you're fatigued. Now I've got to put you in the little baby harness here, and we'll take you in, you know, and then you can rest up. But, uh... But yeah, it never struck me as just how in- incredibly uh, forward-thinking, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to other ones. The which emphasis on race. Yeah, which is not yeah. to say that the Stone uh, Soup uh, Dungeon Crawl is regressive or anything like that. Well, uh, yeah, it's different because race is much more important. In that. It does affect how much um, mana points, how many health points you get per level, how quick you, you level up, mm-hmm. but you can overcome any of your, your innate uh, obstacles. You can have oh like like uh, oh minus four. You got like four negative levels on your your skill for spell casting. Good luck doing that. If you really want to, you can overcome, and that's kind of awesome. I do like that. Yeah, but uh, uh, it occurs to me that the focus, uh, how to think, because let's face it, even Tolkien, race was very big. Um, mm-hmm. Well, socially, like well, well or well, no, it was, you haven't. Did it was uh, like we'll take uh, the scene from the first of uh, the three movies where they're trying to go through the uh, the pass when you know it's like oh let's not go to Moria oh but we can't go south of the mountains because that will take us too close to Isengard so let's just walk over the pass and then you've got the the dwarf sludge and through the snow and you got the the hobbits you know up to their armpits in the snow Gandalf who is a, a powerful wizard. 
and equivalent in, 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 in all intents and purposes to being like an angel for, for his equivalency to, to like more modern, you know, like a mythological, what yeah, is he's, he? he's a Maiar. Yeah. Um, they're all walking through the snow. Gandalf is way steep. Legolas is walking on the snow. Just do, 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 just just a tiptoeing on the snow, like it's nothing for him. Yeah. He doesn't have to obey the laws of gravity and mass. <laughs> and you know, it's like, oh no, these these are elven shoes that work like snowshoes because I'm an elf. I'm better than you, even you, Mister Super Magic Man. Yeah, I'm not sure. It, I'm not sure if that is an aspect of this story that I particularly like, um, because I I don't think Tolkien ultimately. I mean, he has instances where the elves are magic. But he also has instances where no, it's not that they're magic; it's just that they're very, very skilled. At they're what awesome. They do. <laughs> they're so much better than you, white elf. <laughs> but this also works into when you look at uh, the ranger uh, Strider himself, Aragorn. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is of noble blood. He is the king of Gondor. Yeah. Or he's supposed to be the king of Gondor, sort of thing. And uh, why is he able to wield, you know, the the sword of kings and, and command this and that? Why is he able to do that? Because he's of noble blood, and that's and because he's better than other people. Well, that's effectively the same thing as being a different race. Uh-huh. Why are you supposed to be the king? Why are the stewards not as good? Because you are noble born. So yeah. you are king. You are divine right to rule. It's like saying you're a different uh, race. Why are you so awesome at treading on the top of the snow when even Gandalf the Grey, the mighty wizard, trudges through it? You were born to be better. You're an elf. Well, I mean, that's one way to look at it. My sort of interpretation of it would prefer... And I don't know if this is correct, according to the token world. My interpretation would be to prefer that, uh, no, elves are able to do that. Like, Legolas is able to walk across the snow. Because he's potentially 3,000 years old, and he's got the time to train on that sort of thing. Yeah, because at some point in his life, or maybe every elf picks up, like, does some sort of training, maybe not on snow, but... Possibly on snow. Well, I mean, he is, he is an elf that goes through the, the woods, sort of thing, so maybe he's learned how to walk around yeah. and not, like, crunch the leaves on yeah, the Yeah, maybe it's walking on leaves or something like that. Or Snow yeah. applies the same way. He goes, oh, no, no, I don't crunch through the snow. You guys just got to learn how to walk on top of it. Yeah. Give yourself a thousand <laughs> years, you'll learn. Although in a lot of ways it's like, no, that's physically impossible without some kind of snowshoe. And, well, maybe he has, like... Spiderweb snowshoes or something like that. Are you can't invisible. really see. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, it could be something like that. Why not? But uh, uh, um, so even in the fantasy sort of stuff, being noble-born, being of a specific race, ha- meant something. It meant usually mm-hmm. something big. Why? Yeah, why yeah. is this hero able to to you know trounce the villain and succeed where so many others have just left their corpses behind? Because he is noble-born. He is actually the the hidden, you know, son of the king that was deposed when the tyrant came in and took over the land. And that's something a lot of people wind up believing in, you know. And, sure, and, yeah. And, and that's, that makes for good stories uh, of their kind. Like, I've always been one to prefer, why did you do this? Because why did you succeed when everyone else failed? You wanted it more. You tried harder. Yeah, I, tried I prefer harder. a story where, you know, like, no. Or you had the knowledge to do yeah. it. You, no, you, are, you, you are just like a farm boy. You are just, you know, who you are sort of thing. You're not noble born and all that, but you care more. You try harder, you know, and whereas, you know, the like the, the prince comes in and tries doing it and fails. Oh, I give up and, and leaves because why? Oh, <laughs> I just thought I'd naturally do it. I mean, I'm the prince. Doesn't it naturally come easy? Aren't I supposed to win automatically? Because mm. I'm prince. Yeah. So, but so, like, if an elf tries to do something cool, like he better darn well want to be cool at it. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't want to see him succeed so very, you know, adeptly. Okay. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. It is nice to have that person to fight against. I, I would love a story where the, you know the person is always like second best. He keeps trying harder, and the other guys just you know naturally better and all that mm-hmm. but the, that one guy that protagonist just keeps trying because he wants to do it and he wants to win he and that's what drives him an actual motivation source not just oh and it turns out you are of noble blood and therefore the monster dies at your sword swing he cannot uh, you know usurp your divine blood at all he cannot even mm-hmm. spill it ah you you slay the monster and win the day yeah, I guess that's not as satisfying. Well, when you put it that way, it's not as satisfying. That's what I always wind up reading it as. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
maybe that's just me. Maybe that says something about me for, you know, like blood bias versus, you know, desire. Um, but that's how I prefer it. Yeah. That's the one thing I had it against Harry Potter uh, so often in, in the movies uh, I was watching. Uh, why did he save the day? Oh, well, things were set up. He was the only one who could have done it that way. There's special guards against him and all that. He's the boy that lived. Harry Potter, Harry Potter. Why does he get an A? <laughs> Dumbledore likes him. 50 points for Gryffindor. <laughs> and it always struck me as like, no, no, I want Harry Potter to win. I want Harry Potter's house to win the day because Harry Potter is awesome. Why? Because yeah. he's trying harder. He wants to catch that, uh, that that golden snitch. Not just because he's really good at the broom. Maybe that's a nice touch for him. You know, he's naturally uh, adept for it. Mm-hmm. That's a nice way of for someone like a fish out of water to, to find their way, you know, in sort of thing. But uh, not just like, oh, and then he catches a golden snitch, the game is over. I, I don't like the rules for, for that, that dang game because why play anything else other than trying to catch the snitch if it's a, almost a guaranteed automatic win? Yeah, that is odd. I don't understand. <laughs> I love Harry Potter in a lot of ways. Um, and he, he was, yeah, he was naturally, like, this, the minute he got on a broom, it was like, oh, this kid's got some talent. But he he worked hard after that, right? Like he did he, work hard at it, and that's why I was gradually more opening up to him. And, and the one, uh, oh, which which one movie is it, where Dumbledore gets kicked out and that, that pink lady comes in, that, that really prissy one everyone hated? The one that they wanted to see die more than Voldemort himself. I don't remember which one that was. But yeah, in that one, he's actually training in secret. There's, they got that secret room sort of thing for those yeah. who need it. And they're training spells. That's when I first started to really like the Harry Potter character. Yeah. I was okay with the movies beforehand. You know, hey, magic, fun stuff to see. Ooh, look at Magical Beast. Oh, good special effects. No, this one, I actually started liking Harry Potter. Why? Because he studied. <laughs> Yeah, I preferred Hermione long yeah, well, before because she say, studied. Hermione applied herself. I mean, exactly. almost like to a obsessive, obsessive degree. Yeah. <laughs> but at least I can understand her motivation. Why should she win? Because she's studying. She's trying she's harder. For it. I would have liked to seen her go into the games and just whoop the pants off of everyone there. Why? Because she knows the stuff. She knows the meta game. Oh, that's right. I took out the book on how, you know on, on the tactics and stuff. So while you're out there trying to catch the snitch, I'm actually looking at the tactics for who's moving what where. And that way, even though we didn't get the golden snitch, we got enough points to win the game. Actually, that does or as a coach would probably make a really good rule. Yeah. But that does actually make me think because a lot of times what happens with like ancient games and stuff is like they have weird things like oh you know the obvious way to win is to get the snitch but nobody does because the game has been played for thousands of years exactly the same with no changes and even though there are dumb things it's simply tradition that and I, I think a lot of well the yeah the, the crazy queen <laughs> style of chess the one that we currently know and play is really idiosyncratic um, yeah. But it is a lot more entertaining than everybody moves like a pawn. Or, no, actually, everyone initially moved like the king. The king is the only one that still moves like the traditional pieces. Oh, everyone yeah. initially just yeah. moved one square at a time. And that caused, you know, like long, slow, boring games. So the different moving styles, uh, you know, switches things up, changes place, makes you think harder. And in that case, I'm all right with it. So, which is not to say that, yeah, things, you know, like, but, I mean, you can equate that out to the... Oh, like, do you want to uh, equivocate out the the concept of the chessboard as, like, race or class? So the which pieces are which? Like the bishop, yeah. bishop would, would knight? Would the pawns be considered a different race than, say, the rooks? Or would you consider them classes? Mm. Well, I, I, I think race is more obviously correlated to something like e- each side has a color, so... That would make more sense. Like humans versus orcs. Like humans on one side, orcs on the other well, side. Well, in this case, how the the pieces move. Would the various yeah. chess pieces be considered different races from each other in this thing, or different classes? Well, obviously, a knight is a horse with a man on top, so that the horse is a different race. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. is I, I'd have to say, uh, upon a quick reflection of the whole thing, it would have to be more of a race thing with the odd choice of the uh, the pawn being able to turn into any race once it gets to the other side. Yeah, because if it was like a class based, that's your that's your your stable boy though that grows up and like and becomes reaches the, the end oddly named queen of superpower. <laughs> yeah, uh, in this case, I guess it'd be a stable girl. In which case, I'm all for that. That works for a nice story too. Um, 
But in this case, if it was more of a uh, like a class-based system where the pawn was a different class, in which case you could have a nice, interesting variant on chess, whereby what you do is that you you there are a certain amount of points for each enemy piece you capture, right? So that's how they determine like, okay, game over, or stop playing, count up who got the most, and then okay. we'll work it out from there. What you could do is have a nice variant on chess where it's like, okay, I've gotten 10 points of enemy. I will spend 10 points to upgrade one of my rooks to a bishop. And then all of a sudden you get an extra bishop on that thing in place of the rook. Or maybe you only do that with a pawn. So it's like, okay, it's a yeah. pawn is one point and uh, the rook is five. I've gotten four points of enemy units. I will upgrade one of my pawns to a rook. Da-da-da-da! In which case... Uh, Actually, that sounds like a pretty fun little variant to, to play. If you get bored with chess, try it out. Send us a letter, see how you like it. And level up chess, yeah. Uh, well, in that case, it, it works a little bit more like checkers sort of thing. Because you, you can have... Checkers is more common to get a unit at the end of the board. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you, know, you get those game. promotions, yeah. Um, that said, you know... Um, Chess is a very basic sort of game. Even still, it's it's an old game with its well, basic in terms of its rules. Like, yeah, it's very, it has very simple rules. Obviously, it has, can become quite complex. Well, it's, it's, yeah, it's just infinite in its complexity yeah. potentially. There are more apparent chess p- uh, positions, like uh, you know, like in recording like the chess board. More different ways to have everything go about than there are atoms in the Milky Way. Huh, cool. So yeah, good luck trying to you know perfectly solve that deep blue. You'll never get that. <laughs> yeah, but you're making a point though. Sorry, uh, I stepped on it. But yes, it's it's still a, a very basic game. Whereas something like D and D is much more complex in, yeah. in terms of of, of, of the, any of, of like the the, the role playing games tends to be much more in, intrinsically complex. Uh, just because, well, let's see, in the Stone Soup one, there's something like. Uh, Two, just over two dozen races and about 15 or so classes so potential combos and different ones it's yeah it's much more complex than chess yeah yeah I can see that so uh, I think you get a better look at, at uh, complexity and determining which one you want to have matter more for, for various factors uh, than it's to say like uh, oh I'm, I'm going to play a rook heavy game and get extra you know rooks in and, and less pawns sort of thing you can't do that in chess it's not that complex right. you're not allowed for it there's you have to really work hard to get a third side into a good game of chess you know play the red team <coughs> Chinese checkers and that's says five Five or six. Yeah. Well, it can be that sort of thing, but usually they just play it with three as, as they work through there. You know, um, but you you can do that if you want. Play all six sides, and things get really complex then. <laughs> all right. Um, hmm. So in the end, is there a personal preference for you as to which matters more? Uh, having race matter all the way through, have class matter all the way through, or would you simply like to see race matter a little bit more in the later levels uh, of stuff like D&D? Uh, I, I see race as almost entirely role-playing, because in the world of, in the, the mythos, like, you know, in the context of the world of D&D, you really can use magic to become, to look like anything you want. To become to any skill, and to, to do anything. All it is is you know, it takes a little bit of magic dust and poof, you're an elf now. Mm-hmm. So, I guess, I mean, is that my preference? I th- well, I think that's how I think it should be. Well, here's yeah. the thing: yeah. is they have some of the more advanced ones, the Gith uh, Zeri, the Gith Yankee, that uh, gain powers based on their level. Uh, yeah, level nine, they gain the ability to plane shift. The Drow also have some spells, spell-like abilities that they gain. As they some play. like that, yes. It's not quite the same, though, as, as the more powerful Gith Yankee Gith yeah, yeah. sort of examples. So would you prefer something where, where dwarves gain bonuses? Like, okay, so it doesn't matter what class you are, at level 7, you gain like advanced stone cunning where your plus 2 becomes a plus 4, or you gain, like, a, oh, you're level 4, you gain the stone form, you can... Uh, you know, one round per constitution, uh, you know, uh, point, turn to stone, you know, and that, you know, cures poisons out of you and gives you a nice AC bonus, but affects your speed. Would you like that sort of thing to be in there, where, you know, the the class has extra bo- perks at different levels sort of thing? Uh, I think so, but 
I, I will say, like, I don't want it to be the same for every high level dwarf character. That's I I do I like the idea that a high level dwarf, like a you know this this dwarf who's been adventuring for ten years, learns some special abilities relating to dwarfitude. Yeah, it would have to be something that that's pure dwarfy, not just like oh, you know, if you're like this class race, you gain this, you know, one. And versus at seven, you know, at seventh level, yeah, stone form, but only for warriors, you gain uh, like an app bonus to earth based magic if you're a wizard. Yeah, no, no, just something that's pure dwarfy. Yeah, but at the same time, like I don't want to see a world where every tenth level dwarf has the exact same. Oh, that, uh, maybe, but depends what it is. I think. Um, it just seems like it'd make more sense if, if simply, you know, dwarves have that thing, sort of, that they're, they have something they're born with, they have something they learn as, like, when they're raised, as a, you know, in dwarven society, they all train how to learn looking at stones and, like, studying them. and Or their martial philosophies where they gain the bonus yeah. against giants and, and uh, yeah, some yeah, things stuff like, like that. that. Um, but then once you start an adventuring career, I don't... I don't see the logic in, like, because mystically in your past you were a dwarf at one time, now suddenly this latent thing comes to the fore. Um, you become the true <laughs> essence of dwarvenness, you know, sort of thing. So, yeah, your crafting, it takes on, you do double the speed whenever you're doing a crafting thing. You get double the effect of wolf craft. You do, it takes you a week to get a sword done. It took me three days, buddy. <laughs> three what are you, human, man? I'm a dwarf, man. I, I craft like nobody's business. There's a sword for you right now. Get back to work. I, I guess I could imagine something like the, the dwarf has reached 10th level and suddenly, like, ancestral knowledge comes back to him and, like, infuses his arms and his he becomes but at the same time it's like that feels a little metagamey well what if it is just something like uh, you've adventured enough and then you know you've learned enough about you not just in whatever class you are you've learned enough about what it is to be you to be a dwarf that you've truly unlocked the greatness of, of, of like uh, like what made your ancestors great and you understand that as part of you you couldn't do that without all the adventuring you went without all mm -hmm. the trials and hardships to figure out who you were yeah uh, true but then my same question again does every 10th level dwarf get that same exact revelation about themselves well, I mean, it'd be cool. It'd be better probably if they have some options, maybe some things to choose from, and that's sort of racial feats that that's been done in the game as, as specific feats that you can take as a race because you are a dwarf and you've reached tenth level. You're allowed to take this dwarf only feat now. Well, that works pretty good. I do like something as a bonus though, just just because you've made it hey to such a level and. Uh, just something to affect a little bit more to make sure that your race actually matters a little bit more throughout the levels. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I'm not against that per se, but also I feel that like hopefully you're also working on this in a role playing sense, and hopefully mm -hmm. like as a tenth level dwarf, you're earning you know you've become the dwarf, uh, the baron of your dwarf homeland or so, you know. Or just the protector of hero. <laughs> yeah, you, you get some yeah. title and you get some reputation among the dwarves. Well, that goes back to the second edition thing with like a 10th level fighter starts automatically gaining followers and they become a lord and they automatically gain like a title and land. That was, that always seemed weird. It's like, it is a bit weird if it's automatic. Well, yeah. that's, that's, that's the weird thing is it was part of the core mechanics mm -hmm. of second edition yeah. for fighters and you'd roll randomly see what sort of guys you'd wind up getting for special elite troops. But you could spend it like ten levels just killing rats in the local sewers. Yeah. If you were proficient enough that you could kill them before dying of old age, you'd get out of the sewers and they say, "All hail, Lord Dungeon Killer!" <laughs> you know, the, the guy who walks in the sewers and kills ten billion rats. Ah, uh, here, have this fiefdom on the edge of the land. And that seemed really out of place. Well, it, yes, because I mean, it depends on your dungeon master, right? Because it, the dungeon master he could sort of create a, like, shoehorn in a story about how, well, you became, like, the sewer, you know, urchins or something gathered around you and, and started to support you because they saw all the rats you were killing in the sewer and sort of... And they were eating those rats, <laughs> so you were, like, their, their, their prime, yeah. you know, food giver. And basically, they've built this cult or, or organization around you, and you don't even have to really do anything because they've just basically, you know, this is, you've become 
more than just you know you become a heroic figure to them. That's sort of the nature. Of, I mean, that's how D and D works, right? So yeah. if the DM is able to spin that sort of story, that works. Also, it still <laughs> seems a little <laughs> weird that that you've been killing so many rats, they decide to give you a large parcel of land, and then you gain like troops with armor, and yeah, sometimes it'd be like. Like you could you be killing like like creatures in the local sewers enough to gain that level, and then all of a sudden, because of how you rolled randomly, you get guys on horseback coming to try and follow you. What are the horses going to do down there? They can barely fit. Well, uh, maybe the DM could also fudge that a roll. Bit. Sort of thing. Well, I mean, maybe it turns out that the horses don't come, or maybe it turns out that you know maybe they're giant rat, rat riders yeah. or. <laughs> or slime rats. No, no, no. If you're going to be killing so many rats, they'd be on like giant, like like cats, cats like big panther yeah. sewer riders, sewer panthers or something. Yeah. Sewer panther. Oh boy, that sounds like fun. I <laughs> find the stats on that beast. And and you know, it doesn't have to be humans, right? Maybe they're halflings or even like pixies. Well, that's the thing. Is, is, is it's all randomly rolled back in second edition. Yeah, true. And um, so, okay, I can understand you, you, your concept from this perspective then for having a little bit more variation, something that fits a little bit better. Yeah, and it's sort of like the whole story of D&D, how you need a DM because you need to... You, I mean, the, Until you we get proper enough AI that we can phase <laughs> the dungeon master out. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, all, we're working towards it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you have these absurd scenarios within D&D, and it, it's helpful to think about them. Obviously, that's why we bring them up, because... It's helpful to think of solutions for them, but also it's just you know the dungeon. It's just the dungeon master has to say no. That's absurd. I'm going to change that. You know that's just how it has to be with D and D. It's one of the that's its weak. That's weakness in some way, but it's also it's a very powerful strength. Yeah, to to de ridiculify things. <laughs> yeah, but of course, like you get such good stories too. Like if you if you have that the sewer king who kills all the rats in the sewer and he has horsemen coming to them. That's a great... I mean, it's absurd, but if you can tell it, like, that's a good story. If you can figure <laughs> out the way to connect those two threads... 30 knights suddenly appear in the room, <laughs> in the 10x10 10 10 room, <laughs> with all their horses... They kneel the down before you and swear allegiance. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. that's the thing is, is the rangers would gain, like, mystical woodland companions, mm -hmm. but rangers could still be in, in the sewers... <coughs> In the sewers, just as well, going down there and, and like slaying, you know, like the mm -hmm. the you know the, the dreaded like sewer moccasin, or, you know, snakes and all that. And then all of a sudden, oh, a dryad decides to try and help you. It's like, where's your tree, lady? Please tell me you don't have a sewer tree. <laughs> I don't need this. This is creepy, oh. even for me. <laughs> Yeah, well, it is creepy, but D and D has creepy things in it. You gotta admit that. Yeah, but the concept of a dryad forever trapped under the you know the city in the sewers well, sort of thing. Trapped? No, it's, it's well, they're they're confined based according to the, yeah. the, the the location of their tree. So if the tree is for some reason able to grow in the sewer, like there's a large like a uh, like manhole, you know, like grate cover that shines enough light that a sickly tree can grow there, and that's where the you know like oh, oh it comes beautiful, from. Beautiful though. It's tragic because it's she's constantly it's surrounded by. This would be like like taking a, a, like a, a kid that's her and, home. and putting them in in like a the sewer and this raising them there. That's like hideous. Yeah, but no, it's a, it's to her. It's home. It's beautiful for her. I mean, obviously we don't appreciate. It's that. raw human and humanoid waste. There's nothing beautiful about it. And even if you're raised there, it stinks. <laughs> Probably a lot of filth fever, too. So, oh, I thought everybody got filth fever on a monthly basis. What are you talking about? You're healthy. You've never gotten it before. You freak. Oh, well. I... <laughs> um, it, it, if you... <laughs> let me tell you that If you don't... If you're a ranger, uh -huh. and you don't want a dryad as a companion who is, like, trapped, trapped in the, 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 the multi-level sewers of the metropolis you've apparently spent ten levels adventuring yeah. in. Don't spend ten levels adventuring there if you didn't want that. But I'm just saying the possibility is very much there. Yeah, sh sure, the possibility is there for a lot it's of like, things. Oh, brownies and spriggans. Oh, please tell me you guys weren't living down here. I don't want to know what you were mischievously stealing from folks coming up through their, their privy holes and, and stealing things and... That seems natural to me. It seems Maybe that's like where all the socks wind up disappearing to. I mean, yeah, in sewer <laughs> gnomes coming up in the middle of the night, stealing your socks and flushing themselves back down. 
<laughs> the sewer gnomes. I think we might have a title for this. <laughs> Just the concept of, of like, oh, that's that's why they have the red pointed caps. Is that's where they dive with? Man, it's just like a pointed oh, yeah. uh, diving cap right. for them. Pointed diving cap. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so wait, was that was that my toilet flushing itself in the middle of the night? That's how you know the sewer gnomes were there stealing your socks, man. Uh, but I had one other thing I had that that I don't think people like think about too much with, with regard to D&D is that sort of I think the original uh, assumption of of your class and your character <laughs> is that you don't actually see your character most of the time most of their life you see them while they're pl- in the dungeon and you see them you know in buying goods in town or, or little role playing vignettes and whatever but most of the time you don't see them and then it, it's in that time that they're actually spending their time doing the things that make them their class or race or whatever. You know, they're doing their training. They're doing this and that. So they're they're spending a lot of time on becoming the fighter or the, the, the druid better or the wizard ranger or the wizard. And yes, it's the fights that earn them their XP, but it's their actual lives that earn them their abilities and skills and everything. And that, that actually makes them better at stuff. Hmm. So it's not a bad point, not a bad point. I've just, uh, I mean, it still gets me. I'm going to have to start looking at more of my fiction back and forth as to see, you know, where they've decided to put this balance between what you do and who you are and what matters more. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, it really is a very profound question to ask. Like, uh, this could determine a lot about a person by by where they, they tilt these scales when they're writing. Yeah, yeah, well, I think so, yeah. And, and like, yeah, my... my I guess my personal feeling on it is that your background actually shouldn't matter so much. It should matter more your ideas and your like the things that you do going forward and your you know what you do in the future. Your your present actions matter more than your background. But that's just sort of I, I'm open to can't fantasy stories in which you know that whole bloodlines and racial thing. I mean that can be cool. I, I mean it's it's also got a little hint of racism and, and other stuff mixed into it, but it, it can be really cool. Good stories, too. Done right, it can yeah. be really cool. Done wrong, it's really painful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, in the end, I suppose it's just like a, like a three-way scale of, of uh, you know, like who you are, you know, uh, versus your background versus what you want. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, so I encourage everyone out there who's uh, who's writing their own thing, you know, who's who's deciding to tell their own story, you know, designing their own campaign, go back and take a look and, and see where you've decided to, to put your focus. Does it matter what you are? Like, sometimes it, it, it does work on that. Um, the birthright campaign, it's generally assumed pretty much everyone is going to at least try and be of noble blood because that gains them special powers and there's fun things you can do about stealing the bloodline power and strength from others. And there's a whole thing that, that really gives a mechanism for the uh, the bloodline royal feuds of Europe throughout history. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a nice little magic flair, with a nice little uh, bit of kind of like a, a Welsh feeling to it, sort of thing. Um, well, like not the just King not Arthur type? Well, ki- yeah, kind of King Arthur. Well, the thing is, some groups of the humans are more towards the Mongol end, but it very much does have the whole sense of, of you know, like, who is of right blood? Who is of better blood? Why do the nobles fight against each other? And it's not just because it's like two dicks with you know daggers trying to figure out who gets to sit on the throne. This yeah. sort of thing actually means like uh, who has the most legitimate right of rulership. And so in like birthright, yeah. you can do the right to you know it's like I have defeated you, and because you are of noble blood and I am of noble blood, and I defeated you in proper combat, I take some of your divine right to rule, and I increase my bloodline strength. Yeah, and so that works for a story, and it, it does give a nice uh, way to tell uh, an equivalent story of what was going on in Europe's history. Not just Europe's history; it's pretty much been everywhere. But it is in medieval, pseudo medieval style, so it works best as you know a metaphor for actual medieval European history. Yeah, I guess, so. and I suppose that that's a good way to have insight into a character, even if you, as a player, sort of believe in the whole meritocracy idea and that it should be your ideas and your actions that define you. Um, it may be the case that your character um, values race or bloodline more than he probably should. He or she probably should. So there's that. And and maybe 
I mean, also, maybe valuing that bloodline, that can be a positive or a negative. That can be, like, it might cause you to sit on your laurels and just wait for things to be handed to you. Or, um, or like, the, the, the traditional, uh, like, immortal elven philosophy of, uh, well, we'll just wait it out. Oh, kobolds are inhabiting there? We'll just wait till they die out. They're a short-lived race. We don't have to really worry about that. They'll be gone in three, four hundred years at most. Yeah. Um, but it also it's possible that it, that sort of that whole idea might spur you to to action and to to be like no I I am born of the the race of these people who are action guys and who like do stuff and you know lead armies so I'm gonna do that too because we do that I I, I so the thing is I do like the Forgotten Realms uh, stuff for its its ability to have the regular person rise up like because of playing the Stone Soup thing Drizzt Duerden has gotten a little bit more respect in my eyes. Okay. Because it's not the fact that he's a drow, it's not the fact that he's, like, twinked overpowered and all that. He did something against his natural attributes and, and society, and he, it's what he really wanted to work at. And as I'm thinking more about that now. I'm thinking, you know what, Driz? You're a little bit more all right in my books. You're still not on the good pages, but you're a little further out of the, the black pages. So, cause I, okay, I, I, now that I've seen this and I'm, I'm thinking a little bit more, you gain a little bit more value in my eyes because you went against, you know, what was naturally thought of for your people and your inclinations, and you went because you wanted it. You wanted to do that other thing, and, and that's what you did, and that's how you became who you are. Okay, okay, I can respect mm -hmm. that now that I've thought about it more. So, yes, this, this, uh, this new game I've tried out has made me <laughs> um, respect Drizzt. Yeah. Um, well, I have one more th one more thought to add, though, and I think I've mentioned this before too. But humans are awesome. Like in the real world, humans are pretty. We are fast. an ultra apex <laughs> predator, um, and they're like, if you look at other species, there are no other species that come close to what we are able to do. To rock out like, how bad and hard we rock <laughs> out. It's funny because you you pick almost any single attributes like oh humans use tools well yes yeah, some animals use tools humans use language well we taught some gorillas how to use sign language um, and maybe dolphins talk to each other and, and have names for each other and things like that so it's like little bits but humans as an aggregate humans just have so much going for them that they're just they're they dominate when biologically you might not suspect it because I mean like yeah. oh look at that lion he's got claws like this yeah, and exactly. teeth like that look at look at that leopard he's going so fast and it's like, oh my goodness, look at the rhinos over here. They can just stampede over whatever the heck they want and crush them <laughs> underfoot. They're awesome. Exactly. What does this thing got? <laughs> he's pale and... Where's his claws? He's got hair growing out of some spots but not others. What's, what's go is, that, is that like a camouflage thing going on? Where's he supposed to be hiding? What is this thing? It's like, it is the killer of all other beasts. It is man. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. So, yeah. so in D and D, you have all these other uh, like races, but really they're basically just humans because they're humans with funny hats as well. Yeah, tends to go because they have the main the attributes of humans that that make us uh, so awesome is the, the opposable thumbs and the reasoning and the language and all that stuff. So, uh, just uh, riffing on that uh, just to a little bit, um, there are it might be possible to have, like, interesting races who have serious deficiencies. Like, I mean... The orcish uh, intellectual deficiency of I prefer to smash before I think about things as yeah. a stereotype. Uh, yeah, something like that. And I was thinking, like, dwarves in... Like, we put dwarves in stories now almost as if they're, like, fully... Um, uh, th well, their own, their own race... Um, their own, like, you know, they breed true with each other and they have yeah. little baby dwarfs and and uh, they don't have, like, I don't know, like a deficiency of some kind. But, okay, by the way, in your ideal fantasy campaign world, do dwarven babies have beards? Yeah, little beards. Little, little dwarven baby yeah. beards. Nice little fuzz patch um, going on there. It's like, oh, he's six years old and he's already got himself a nice little goatee. Yeah, yeah, they're born with, yeah, just a very light, you know, light baby hair, but yeah, it's and then it darkens and thickens as they, as they grow older. And, and by the time they're in kindergarten, they can they can braid it. <laughs> I can dig that. Okay, their I can first, do that, yeah. Their first braid. Um, <laughs> they learn how to braid their beards in kindergarten. Just like you learn how to tie your shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I can dig it. Um, all right, so yes, you were saying, sorry. Uh, uh, they the braid through their, their own yeah, race and all that. Yeah, but I mean, sort of 
fantasy dwarfs came sort of from our human version of small people in the real world who often have mm. dwarfism along with partially well. there was also that Norse thing about the the dark elves yeah that were interpreted as dwarves okay that were the magical crafters they just happened to live in small areas you know and so well they must be small right small cave yeah but so so this whole the the dwarfism comes along with a lot of like it's basically it's a health problem it's yeah it's yeah the, there is didn't be go that, away. you know put in the mix <laughs> very prominently in some cases. Yeah, so it... And it might be the case that for fantasy races... Um, so elves would be could, anemic? Well, yeah, you could Once throw you cut in. one, they always bleed until magically healed? Oh, that... Yeah. I sure can dig it. That, yeah. Ah, heal check! Heal check! Oh, God! Oh, God, I bleed! I bleed! Ah! Because I... Yeah. Why did I take ranks in, in alchemy <laughs> so I could have made myself a potion of coagulation? I mean, I don't oh, know how well dizzy. this works for a game. That's the thing for... If you're playing a it game... It would be kind of fun to roleplay that sort of thing. It'd be, I think it would work great for a story to have... It would definitely keep elves mm-hmm. away from the, you know, the martial classes. Ah, 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 I stick with bows and ranged <laughs> weapons and magics, man. I just... Just don't pierce the skin. <laughs> All right? Mm-hmm. So okay, yeah, anemic elves kind of work. Yeah, and so 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 give these like really major drop because humans so it, like are are great and maybe they should be great compared to the other. The so would race. that make hobbits like uh, overeating gluttons and like hoarders then? Maybe hobbits couldn't run or something like that. Hobbits can. Well, if they're you know let's see breakfast you know second <laughs> breakfast eleven C's lunch uh, afternoon tea dinner <laughs> supper. Uh, midnight snack. Oh yeah, if you're having like eight decent meals a day, maybe you shouldn't be able to run. Maybe you're just a little hefty there, eh? Or maybe hobbits don't float; they just sink. Or should they float? I don't know. Ah, uh, well, geez, if they're having eight meals a day and they're as round as they're portrayed as, uh, their body, you know, mass index is going to indicate they should probably float very well. Yeah, they should float well. I guess if they eat lots of fatty food... If they try to swim, they're probably going to get cramps. (laughs) Because there's no point in their waking cycle. They're not far enough away from having a meal that they're not going to get a cramp. Yeah, although I think that... According to the old wives' tale, yeah. Anyways, yeah. Myths are a ripe territory for (laughs) D&D. For any (laughs) fantasy sort of thing to to, to work with. Is is there a rule in D&D about swimming after eating? There should be. Uh, I can see a DM imposing uh, a nice point penalty. It's like, dude, you just ate so much turkey, and now you're trying to swim. I don't know why you took a turkey with you <laughs> instead of proper, you know, like iron rations, but this is the penalty you take for it. Make a fortitude save. Ah, crap! Crap! <laughs> crap! Dwarf has to doggy paddle up and get you and doggy paddle back. <laughs> That's how I imagine dwarfs swimming. I, I don't know why. I just see them doggy paddling. It just seems right. Uh, so d- uh, well, let's see. We've been talking, probably used up all of our time um, for this week. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, ultimately I don't think there's any one that's uh, more preferential than the other for, for where you want to put, uh, y- you know, who you are, what you want, and what you are. Uh, mm-hmm. There's a balance. But finding out why you've put it there and how that can help out your story, I think it's a very great idea. Yeah, it's just something to think about. Yeah. Um, sure. Well, and, and how you want to play with that, you know, putting more emphasis on one versus the other. You can come up with some very weird things, like, uh, like, well, like I said, the for, you know the, the birthright uh, campaign setting actually plays with a concept like, what if being noble born really did matter? What if that actually does do things for you? And then they went with that, and that's what made such a weird, fun little setting that they've never reproduced in second edition. I don't know why, but yeah. Well, I mean, there's so much stuff that they haven't redone. It's it's quite. Yeah, but they can always make decent uh, cash off of doing like a, oh, a one-time good. splat book toss-out sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Look forward to it maybe in fifth edition. But uh, but yeah, they they decided to play with it so that you know like what you are really did matter. It was, mm-hmm. and so that the, like the what we consider like the almost insane concept that that being noble actually makes you better or different than the ra- average person. They went with that as being like a real thing. And it's that sort of stuff. I mean, that's that's like ideas, like, like well, the idea that ideas matter and change, you know, like who you can be and the universe itself. That's how they got Planescape. Mm-hmm. Sure. And so, yeah, playing with these variables and seeing what really matters and taking that away from actual reality really can help out uh, your writing, your uh, 
your campaign your setting, whichever, yes. whichever way you're going with it. Even if it's only in your, your elven character's head that, I'm an elf, I must be better than you. And if not, I will come up with a magic spell that will temporarily make me better than you, and I will use it at every given opportunity. Because, you know, it sounds yeah. like something a racist elf might wind up doing. Yeah, uh, for sure. Well, I guess um, that's all. Uh, all right. I did mention our email address for the future listeners, but in case you missed it for some reason, the simulationist at gmail.com. Uh, quick uh, right. quick notice out there, uh, in addition, that uh, Godicon is coming up uh, very quickly. It's almost the end of uh, January, and it's at the end of February. Uh, if you make sure to sign, get your uh, your pre tickets you know, pre-done, uh, for the full like weekend pass, uh, the option for that is uh, February the fourth, I believe. And if you get them, get the whole weekend, you get a set of uh, Chessex dice, you know, with like a Godicon 2014 on there, and your choice of one of two shirts, uh, the so Godicon Adventure Time or Godicon Ponies. So you know, it does matter to actually get that, not just for the price break, but you know, like swag. <laughs> Or I suppose, given that it is, you know, like so heavily invested in the fantasy, loot, loot, fat loot. Yeah. So you know, just putting that out there. Yeah, get your tickets for Gothicon 2014, Victoria, BC. Be there or don't be a square, man. Nerds only. Cool. Yeah. Well. That's all. That I think that's all. Is that? Yeah. I believe for that's, this week. That's all we've got for this week. There'll be another ninety <laughs> minutes in another seven days. Uh, yeah. Look forward to uh, to listening to us to then listening to us again then. Um, if you're or in just to a these, few minutes, yeah. If you're from the yeah future, in the yeah. future in sequence, then uh, yeah, pop on over to the next one or you know you get to effectively loaded. time travel by listening to the past and then skipping a week ahead in the future and listening to us then. So yeah, we will uh, be back in a week, and for you. Well, we'll see Why you when we see you. Take care. Okay? I've been Josh Levin. I've been Ryan Kirkby. Then Mike.